Okay. Very good. Well, welcome everyone. Um, well, uh, my name is Aaron Rose, and uh, I am the uh, founder and managing director of uh, Global Tactics, a, a multinational uh, consulting firm. But I also serve as chair of the advisory board for StarTides. And it is uh, StarTides that is bringing you uh, today's presentation. I want to thank you for taking the time to join us is we're gonna talk about building resilient societal and communal responses to environmental changes. Uh, we do have a, uh, a group of uh, speakers um, from a diverse background and, uh, and uh, each one I'll provide an introduction uh, to each, each uh, speaker, uh, just preceding uh, their moment to make some remarks. Uh, and then we'll have an open conversation. Uh, I'll moderate some questions, but uh, this is, I'm hoping that this is going to be a really a, a community gathering uh, to, uh, to discuss uh, these issues that seem to be more pressing uh, each, as each day goes by. But let me take a few minutes first to talk about what is StarTides. Um, and essentially, and quite simply, the mission of Star Ties is to build capacity for resilience. Um, the key facet of Star Ties is that it is a global knowledge sharing network that focuses on building sustainable resilience, whereby promoting human security, which is the freedom from want and the freedom from fear, and creating life changing social and economic opportunities. Uh, Star Tides, under the leadership of uh, Dr. Lynn Wells, uh, who's a, a, a speaker with us today, started, founded Star Tides back in 2007 at National Defense University in Washington, D.C. And today, Star Tides is coordinated through George Mason University's Center for Resilience and Sustainable Communities, uh, known as CRASC in Fairfax, Virginia. More specific to the StarTides operations, as I mentioned, it is a global knowledge sharing network and it's organized into seven platforms or technology areas. And you see the seven there, but each one is very distinctive in their own right. The energy, housing, and infrastructure, water, sanitation, and hygiene, ag and food security, uh, ICT, uh, mobility and transportation, which was the the seventh element we just added, uh, and then healthcare, and then through various activities like today's session, supporting research, and in the knowledge sharing, we try to segment uh, deliverables in three areas: the thought leadership, problem solving, and solution development. And we based our what I call our KPIs, our key performing indicators or keys to success, you know, based on the narrative and systems thinking, shared knowledge, of course, and then the resources, education, uh, and some of the other areas like finance, transport, logistics. StarTide's members uh, is loosely uh, gathered around the world um, in various areas, certainly through academia, you know, uh, George Mason University, Shepherd University, University of New Mexico. And this slide just re represents just a few of, of really, you know, you know 3,000 or so individuals or institutions uh, that are part of the Star Tides network. We also have government agencies uh, that are part of our network, uh, the Naval Postgraduate School, the Department of Navy, the DOD, Department of Defense, uh, National Defense University is still a very integral partner. Uh, we work with other uh, national or uh, non-governmental organizations like the United uh, States Institute for Peace. Uh, we have a big uh, 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 partnership, very strong partnership in Puerto Rico with the Puerto Rico Science, Technology and Research Trust. Uh, our international presence uh, spans, uh, you know, in Singapore, as well as in Japan, uh, 
not listed here. We also have uh, relationships in the Philippines. Um, and then we work with private sector actors, uh, uh, Delta Point Solutions, VIP Global Net, uh, of course, my firm, uh, Global Tactics. Uh, we are, uh, you know, operating uh, uh, through public support. And so uh, this is basically your commercial of the day. We do welcome tax deductible uh, donations that goes through George Mason's uh, Center for Resilient and Sustainable Communities. And that is really the introduction to Startides. I do want to start with our first speaker. Again, uh, our speakers uh, will uh, spend you know, 5, 10, maybe even 15 minutes uh, presenting uh, their expertise and, and unique perspective on the, on the topic at hand. Uh, and then afterwards, uh, we will go into a uh, open discussion. Uh, if you have questions along the way, uh, feel free to put them into the uh, chat box. And uh, I will make sure um, that uh, the questions will be raised uh, accordingly. Uh, I do want to take this time to introduce uh, Professor uh, Kathy Lasky. Well, I guess once a professor, no always a professor. But Kathy, Dr. Lasky is officially Professor Emerita of Systems Research or Systems Engineering and Operations Research and Director Emerita of CRASC at George Mason University. Uh, in her 32-year career at Mason, Dr. Lasky taught courses in systems engineering, uh, Bayesian reasoning, and decision support. I have no idea what uh, most of that means, but uh, I'm just working on the pronunciation. Her primary areas of expertise are multi-source information fusion, decision support, machine learning, and knowledge representation for reasoning under uncertainty. And there's no question that uh, the uncertainty is a key aspect that we're dealing with, um, and, and even when it comes to predictability of, of weather systems, uh, as, as the United States is, is bearing for another major hurricane. Um, Dr. Lasky has applied her expertise to diverse areas, including crisis response planning, identifying optimal drilling locations for sustainable fo small farm irrigation, and analyzing susceptibility to phishing attacks, detecting insider threats and information systems, and predicting innovations in science and technology and understanding airline delays. Welcome, uh, Dr. Lasky, and uh, go ahead and unmute, and the floor is yours. Hello, thank you very much. I'm going to share I'm not going to give you a briefing, but I am going to share a few images. So let's see, this should. Uh... OK. So I'm going to start with a blank screen. But uh, what I'm going to focus on today is I'm going to start setting the stage by talking about why resilience, although it has always been important, why creating resilient communities is, is becoming ever more urgent and survival critical for humanity. And I'm gonna start here with an image of the statues on Easter Island. Um, there is some scientific uh, controversy, I guess you would say, over exactly how the deforestation occurred on Easter Island. Um, originally, Thor Heyerdahl thought that it was because the people cut down all the trees in order to carry those statues from one side of the island to another. Uh, and then uh, uh, and other people have come along and said, well, no, maybe, but they clear cut the forests for, for agriculture. And, and then somebody else said, well, maybe it was the rats, but the rats stowed away on the ships from the set for uh, carrying the settlers to Easter Island. And then the rats ate all of the palm seeds. But in any, in any case, no matter what, humans are responsible for deforestation and ecological collapse on Easter Island. And it's often used the Easter Island situation is often used kind of as a metaphor for uh, ecosystem dest destruction and thoughtless ecosystem destruction. Now we actually, humanity now, we have a greater understanding of what we're doing to cause the ecosystem collapses that we're seeing around us. And in fact, um, we've had a lot of alarm bells going off. And so the next two images I'm gonna show you are 
uh, I could show you all kinds of natural disaster images, but these are just within the past few months. The uppermost image is a forest fire in southwestern France in um, last summer in July, and that that's kind of um, that. But we see pictures like that from Australia, from Europe, from the United States, from South America, from all over the place, forest fires. Now, it's not like we've never had forest fires, but forest fires are increasing in intensity and frequency. And just at a time when we need to be uh, removing carbon from the atmosphere, forest fire gets rid of some of the greatest uh, carbon scrubbers in the in the world and uh, at the same time adds a lot of carbon to the atmosphere and it causes untold destruction and, and societal damage. Um, and then in the lower left-hand uh, part of the diagram, you see there uh, the recent floods that was in August in Pakistan. Uh, and that is a comp from a combination of glacial melt and torrential rains. And again, we see floods increasing in intensity and increasing in severity. And we're seeing uh, parts of the earth that are going to become uninhabitable within the next decade or two. Uh, so the final picture that I'm going to build up on here, and then I'll just talk a little bit about the implications of this, is from a publication in 2016 talking about um, climate justice. And one of the axes on this from, from uh, green to, to red, it, there's an axis of uh, the uh, of um, the vulnerability to climate change, and the other axis is the contribution to climate change. And you can see that the and the the dark the dark brown actually are the are the greatest contributors to the climate change and also the greatest vulnerability but many of the areas where you see um uh vulnerability to climate change you also see uh, uh areas that are um that are not some of the areas that are not contributing to climate change are so, are some of the most vulnerable and that's something to keep in mind, that the areas that are the most affected by climate change are the global south, and the areas that are contributing the most to climate change are the global north. Um, and so the question is, uh, can as we change the ecology of the earth in drastic ways, can we af avoid both ecosystem collapse and societal collapse on a planetary scale? And creating resilient communities is one of the most urgent needs that we have to keep our society from collapsing. Um, current, the current uh, global warming is about 1.1 degrees Celsius, and we're already seeing widespread destruction everywhere in the world. Uh, we're seeing, as you see in this picture, wildfires, floods, we're seeing droughts, we're seeing water insecurity and disease spread. Uh, we're seeing the floods come from both more intense storms and uh, and glacier melting and which contribute to rising sea levels, um, and then we're seeing ecosystem dest destruction and species die off. Um, and in the short term, and unavoidably, we're going to see worse and worse versions of what we're seeing today. Uh, and at even if we stopped dead in our tracks and stopped emitting now, things would continue to get worse. Um, and scientists are predicting the the uh, international panel, the UN International Panel for Climate Change, the IN, IPCC report that just came out uh, last February, says that between 32 to 132 million people are going to be driven into extreme poverty, and that disease and mortality are inevitable. We're going to see massive impacts on species and ecosystems, including large-scale tree death. Which, as I said before, is uh, so tree death, not just from the forest fires, but also from, for example, encroaching salinity. So uh, trees uh, near coastal areas are are uh, dying because of salt. Uh, we're seeing uh, deforestation in the Amazon from human activity. We're seeing uh, just ecosystem changes are leading to trees dying. Um, the higher the temperature goes, the worse the effects will be. And if we get up to three degrees Celsius, we'll see some really massive changes um, and the risks compound one another. So, for example, uh, you can have heat and drought that will contribute to uh, lower crop yields. Um, and then also the the um, uh, the heat will cause le de decreased labor productivity due to uh, just inability to work hard in the heat. Um, and that will further reduce the yields. Family incomes will be lower. 
But because we're having lower yields, we're going to have higher food prices. And so we're going to end up with massive uh, food insecurity and malnutrition. And the malnutrition will further lower crop productivity. So you can see that these effects of climate change are going to cascade upon each other and make each other worse. Um, and that will cause, and, and as I said, because we're seeing the, the uh, unequal, uh, the, the countries that create the most climate change uh, are the, also the ones that are, um, are, the, are, are the least vulnerable. We're going to see um, a lot of conflict. We're going to see a lot of, of anger against the, from the global south directed towards the global north. We're going to see pressures for migration. Um, and so we need, while we do need to work really hard on reducing carbon and we see some movements in that direction from, uh, uh, in the U S and worldwide, and we are actually seeing some changes, the changes are not at the scale of what's needed, but at least it's something, uh, we also need to work on adaptation. How can we cope with these, uh, reduced, uh, these increased, um, levels of carbon, and uh, we do have now the good news is that we do still have a window of opportunity for uh, for both adaptation and for reducing uh, for reducing the impacts of climate change. Um, and that's where some, uh, 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 that's where um, community resilience comes in, that we can design social programs to target the most vulnerable populations and help them withstand the effects of climate change that will reduce the pressures for migration and will also reduce the hostility and anger and potential for conflict. So, uh, uh, and we can do look at ecosystem adaptation, ways to, to promote sustainable agriculture and restore da damaged ecosystems and improve biodiversity. Uh, and that's gonna be very important, especially for indigenous populations that are living in uh, areas where um, uh, th their livelihood depends on the ecosystem that they live in. Um, and we also have uh, a lot of um, engineering ingenuity is being uh, being directed towards things like flood control, crop varieties that are resilient to various pests and to various uh, weather effects, uh, irrigation. Now, the thing is that the engineering approaches have to be well integrated with the ecology of an area, and they also have to be well integrated with the social community, because if you implement them badly, you can make things worse or they can be you know, useless or worse than useless if they don't align with the population and with the ecosystem. And you'll hear more about that later today. Uh, we need funding, we need political will, and we need a sense of urgency. And the populations that we're working with, we need to work with the populations. Uh, we can't just go in like we used to and be the the you know we're the we're the smart westerners who know what we're doing and we're going to tell you how to live your lives and we're going to give you solutions we have to work with the people and you'll hear more about that in the rest of today so that's the sort of the setting the stage that i wanted to do and i'm going to turn it over to the next speaker now but i thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me great thank uh, you dr lasky yep, it's uh very good let me uh they're a great, uh, great way to, to kind of lay the uh, foundation of our conversation. Um, I do want to introduce now the uh, our second speaker, uh, Dr. Tanya Thornton. Uh, Dr. Thornton is the founder of Delta Point Solutions, an interdisciplinary social policy uh, and administrative sciences consulting firm that utilizes innovative research rooted in performance management and operational modeling. Her firm specializes in projects related to community resilience, emergency management, public safety, critical infrastructure, and grid security. Prior to establishing her own firm, Dr. Thornton was a research assistant professor at, and the director of grants at George Mason University's Shar School of Policy and Government. She also served as a coordinator for its emergency management and homeland security certificate program. Uh, and Dr. Thornton is a member of the Start Size Advisory Board, and she has been involved uh, separately from that. Her mm -hmm. research portfolios included securing contracts from a number of different agencies, including the United States Department of Defense and, and the Department of Energy, as well as FEMA and NOAA and the Department of Homeland Security. 
She has published a number of, of uh, and edited uh, volumes, including Managing uh, Challenges for the Flint Water Crisis, uh, which was in 2021, um, that, she, that was co-authored by Dr. Thornton. And she will talk today about uh, what uh, she's been observing, experiencing in, uh, with the water crisis in uh, Mississippi. Dr. Thornton, over to you. Thank you so much, Aaron, and welcome everyone. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. I am just outside of Jackson, Mississippi, which is where I call home, although I currently live in Virginia. Um, so I am near and dear to all things that have been occurring with the, the crisis that's been unfolding here in Mississippi. So, um, so I'll just go ahead and get started. You know, and speaking about resilience, we know that it's an organizational capacity to recover quickly from a disruptive event with operational, infrastructural, and cultural components, as Dr. Lasky had earlier noted. But differently, however, it is the ability of a substance or an object to back or spring back in shape. So we have to think of this fluid, this uh, fluid nature that has elasticity. The U.S. we know faces increasingly complex risks that are interwoven into all facets of our businesses, our infrastructures, and communities, and that the threat of hurricanes, aka Ian, right now, financial instability. Uh, billionaires are saying that it's going to be February in previous meetings or from last week. Pandemics, which we're still coming down from, uh, COVID-19, cybercrime, social unrest, terrorism, and every other kind of event of significance that you can imagine will flow from our participation in the global economy and to our everyday life. But in speaking about critical infrastructure, we know that those risks pose a special problem for our country today and every part of the country, specifically uh, in, the, in the Deep South, but also in D.C., which I'll note mo more about in a moment. But it's not just about in the United States, it's an international and a community kind of phenomenon. After all, place does matter. Um, resilience provides that bridge between the possible and the ideal. The National Infrastructure Advisory Council considers resilience to be a fundamental strategy that makes businesses grow stronger, communities better prepared, and nations more secure, regardless of where. It is often the most flexible and cost-effective strategy to ensure continuity of services and functions and to minimize the impact of disruptions. The question that a lot of people ask is how much, right? Well, how much is too much if you do nothing and do nothing all scenario? So promoting resilience within and across, especially the four major increasingly inter interdependent infrastructure sectors or systems are energy, transportation, communication, and water. All of these are essentially the nexus of all critical infrastructure systems. These are the ones that support the lifeline systems that are considered essential to the successful functioning of governance and society. And they are the common thread that touches our everyday public service delivery challenge um, across all levels of government. The efficient delivery of government services relies on a power grid that we know is functioning at full capacity. Everyone can recall Texas a few years ago, an operational and expansive communication network. We've seen these go down, especially during Hurricane Katrina, a streamlined and efficient transportation system. Think about Super Stan Sandy and a water infrastructure delivering clean and a full water free of pollution. Flint, now Jackson, and there's others online that we're going to be seeing here in the future. The capacity and equity of these systems are pressing problems for all sectors, what we say tri-sector, public, private, and nonprofit. And the destruction of, or even the inconsistency in these systems will have a deliberating impact upon the economic security and vitality of the nation, both here in the US and, and others as well. Additionally, if such networks are disrupted, there will be a lasting impact on the social cohesion and political trust of the community, as Dr. Lasky also noted. Those two are, are integral in terms of how we trust society and government and what we're going to do in moving forward, especially when we talk about prioritizing the physical and operational condition of these systems, which many of them are crumbling. And by integrating that, that social capital, trust, it we hope it will pro promote a sense of resiliency and provide the necessities for human development that extend beyond traditional physiological and safe 
he needs. But back to water. It is the essence of life, after all. And we know that safe drinking water is a prerequisite for protecting public health and all human activity. And properly treated wastewater is vital for preventing disease and protecting the environment. So again, connecting back to what our theme is here today that Aaron has put together for our panel. So ensuring continuity of drinking water, wastewater treatment and service is essential to modern life in the nation's economy. It's not just about the efficient delivery. It's also about filtration and capturing it. And then also the distillation and distribution. So there's a lot that goes into water utilities that we often dismiss or just don't ever hear about in the news or maybe don't learn about in school. Same thing with the energy grid as well. Remember there was a report earlier this spring there's 40,000 substations in the United States. Nine critical ones go out, we're in the dark. Imagine what would happen if enough significant water systems went out. They're not necessarily all interconnected the same way, but still the threat is there to have significant problems, especially in the face of climate change and where different types of natural hazards are occurring, drought, floodwaters, et cetera. Though not as often studied in disaster research, regional water supply utilities are clearly not resilient to a wide range of disruptions related to these natural events or human-induced mishaps or any, even high-threat actions. And by high-threat, we often think of active shooters or uh, riot violence, things that are traditionally outside of natural or human-induced but are not quite on that terrorism um, perspective. Uh, public water systems represent one of the major elements, as I noted. And in addition to supporting personal water needs, water delivery systems provide for the most effective material for protecting property from fire damage. Again, did we lose Tanya? Talk about that. I guess the internet did not like me there for a moment. We got you back. Go ahead. Aaron, what was the last thing that you heard? So I know where to pick up all my notes. You're, you're talking about the systems uh, infrastructure and uh, adaptation. Um, so they weren't all connected necessarily in the same way. Right. Right. Okay. Well, just to keep on schedule, you know, here in, in, in Jackson, it's just about it being an environmental concern especially with related to now there could be charges filed in violation of EPA Safe Drinking Water Act. If you think about what had occurred in Flint, this is going to be somewhat significant, especially the amount of money that's already been spent on the water systems over the past several years. But now also the money that's being dumped in by the federal government and also by the state government. So there is always this political element It shows that there's challenges in the communications infrastructure. We need to speed up satellite connectivity. We'll allow Dr. Thornton to reconnect here. Actually, if she's able to reconnect, I'll have her have her table. Let me uh, go on to our next speaker, uh, which is the gentleman who kind of is brought us all together through the invention of star tides, uh, Dr. Lytton Wells II. Uh, Dr. Wells brings just an immense amount of leadership experience at the interface of po uh, policy and technology. Um, his career started, uh, STEAM career started as a Naval officer, a uh, graduate of the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis. Um, he worked uh, uh, also with the Office of Secretary of Defense, uh, acting as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Networks and Information in, in Integration and the DOD's <clears throat> Chief, Chief Information uh, Officer in which he saw uh, he, uh, roles he oversaw included the Defense Department's $30 billion budget for information technology and related areas. 
He uh, currently serves as executive advisor to uh, George Mason University's Center for Resilient and Sustainable Communities. And he's a member of the National Association of Corporate Directors. His, uh, in addition to uh, graduating from the United States Naval Academy, where he received a Bachelor of Science degree in Physics and Oceanography, he attended graduate school at Johns Hopkins University, receiving a Master of Science in Engineering, a degree in Mathematical Sciences, and a PhD in International Relations. He's a graduate of the Japanese National Institute for Defense Studies in Tokyo, and he served on the National Advisory Council of the uh, Whiting, Whiting School of Engineering at Johns Hopkins. Dr. Wells has written uh, widely on security issues in English and Japanese journals. He's also edited a series of books on leader, de leader development and international security transformation. He received the Woodrow Wilson Award for Distinguished Government Service from Job Johns Hopkins University and has been awarded a Department of Defense Medal for Distinguished Public Service. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Wells uh, as a speaker. Dr. Wells, over to you. Aaron, thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. So I'd like to build on what's been said. Uh, the Center for Resilient and Sustainable Communities at George Mason has been uh, introduced. I'd like to amplify it a little bit. Um, the, we've been working, the center's been working a lot in three areas recently. One is building digital opportunities in Native American communities. One is uh, Puerto Rican uh, reconstruction, and also, again, digital opportunities there. And the third is uh, linking the different uh, infrastructures of star tides together uh, in various parts of Appalachia. Um, one of the things that we've learned from this or one of the approaches we've taken going in is listening, learning, and lasting. The point being that uh, the first thing you need to do is just be quiet and listen to what your uh, interlocutor, what your community is trying to tell you. Uh, the next is as you provide things to teach, uh, hopefully that's a reciprocal to teaching in both directions. We obviously have a lot to learn from them. But the really important part here is lasting. So that after the grant ends, the student graduates, have we built enough bottom-up capacity in the community to help them continue to develop by themselves? A couple of uh, sort of models, a couple of uh, themes that go with that is the general concept of nothing about us without us. Uh, Dr. Lasky mentioned the importance of the co-developing solutions, and this is absolutely critical. It's um, the nothing about us without us came out of our work in Native American communities. In essence, the point is uh, you don't just go in with a solution and offer it. You work and develop, co-develop the solution. I was part of a very, I thought, uh, well thought out, well designed effort by the Rand Corporation uh, to study the impact of Hurricane Maria and Irma on Puerto Rico uh, after 2017. And it was submitted to the governor's office, uh, where it was very well thought of and uh, accepted uh, and began to be implemented. And then the governor changed. The governor had to leave office suddenly. And uh, the, the study was just sort of dropped and set aside because it had, been, had not been co-developed with the rest of the population. So there was really no stakeholder to support it after the, the government leadership changed. So again, the British have a wonderful term called strategic plans on top shelves, spots. How do you avoid becoming one of those? How do you integrate your processes with the processes of the community? Another key point is what we would call trusted interlocutors. Uh, who are people who can actually interact with the population you're trying to serve, uh, who are trusted by them. Uh, they can, uh, I've said this on several occasions, but I could walk into a uh, tribal council anywhere in the United States and be treated as another old white guy come to lie to us. So how do you find the young Native American uh, representatives who are technically savvy, who can uh, work with us, absorb some of the things we're trying to teach, but then they're the ones who go to the tribal councils, decision makers, and make the case for people uh, they, they trust and interact. The, one of the main premises of what we're trying to do in the community resilience 
is to reduce pressures for migration and marginalization. Again, the point was made earlier about the pending climate change. Uh, one of the founding principles of CRASC was what are the security implications of the replacement of labor by automation and artificial intelligence between now and 2030? For countries like Germany, Japan, South Korea, it's a good deal, aging the declining workforce. What does it mean for countries, for example, in Mideast, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, if there are tens of millions of young people with no entry level jobs and hence no skill uh, and no opportunities really to get them in the marketplace. We saw the million refugees really stressed the European political system in 2015. And these migrations, especially when exacerbated by climate change, potentially are many times that. So uh, what can lots of times when you try to address these kinds of problems, the nation state is too big, the family is too small, on the other hand, the community uh, has common concepts of dignity and justice and fairness, often common language, uh, and that can provide a uh, perhaps a better entry point uh, into uh, dealing with these problems in the larger organizations. Uh, Dr. Thornton mentioned earlier about what resilience is. Uh, one of the points I think is the three kinds of resilience. The one is cultural. I mean, is the organization willing to stand up and fight? No. And this is a result of leadership and it's a result of long-term, what I say, building on a foundation of um, character, I think. So if a corporation, for example, when it gets a cybersecurity incident, basically says, ah, oh, we better sweep this under the rug because it'll reflect badly on us. Well, they're never gonna learn from that. And so how do you find a way to accept the things that haven't gone wrong, incorporate them uh, in ways to do things better, and then um, uh, go forward? The second kind of resilience is operational, which is to say, um, hold on just one second. Sorry. Um, the um, operational essentially is, do you, can you continue to operate during the disruption? Do you have the messaging capability to command and control, what some might call it, in order to get the word out or to tell people inside and outside the organization what you need and what you're doing? Uh, do you have the cash flow to keep operating? Uh, the third is what I call infrastructural. And the point here is, do you understand, again, it was pointed out earlier by Dr. Thornton, the interdependencies among the various infrastructures that you're working with and understand how they may be affected by uh, the changes that are taking place, the interdependencies. So out of this, then, the most important of these, and, and the National Institute for Standards Technology divides resilience into four stages, if you will. And one is anticipate, one is to withstand, one is to respond, but the final is to adapt. And that may, in many respects, adapting to the new post-disruption, new normal is perhaps the most important and perhaps the hardest to teach. But it's also really essential if you're not gonna wind up, we don't, we wanna build, we don't wanna build back. We don't want back to wind up back where we started. You wanna to try to find out the use to become stronger and better by the forces you've gone through. So you wind up bouncing forward better rather than just bouncing back. So anyway, I think those are some of the key points in terms of interacting with communities, uh, listen, learn, and lasting, trusted interlocutors, nothing about us without us, understanding, uh, trying to help them bottom up build the ability to uh, push forward on their own after the uh, external help has ended. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Wells. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Madeline Haas. Ms. Haas is a systems engineer at BAE Systems, focused on implementing systems modeling strategies. She also serves as a member of the Storage Advisory Board and works as an editor for INCOSI's uh, Systems Engineering Body of Knowledge, which is an accessible resource of systems engineering knowledge for educators, professionals, and students. Ms. Haas is currently pursuing a master's degree in operations research at George Mason University. As an undergraduate student at uh, Mason, 
She worked with CRAS to develop an AI algorithm to optimize groundwater access in arid communities. Her interests include model-based systems engineering, artificial intelligence, and machine learning algorithms. Uh, I believe, uh, Ms. Haas, you've got a PowerPoint, so the floor is yours. I do, thank you for the intro, Aaron. So I'm going to start off by talking about designing resilient communities for the future. As previous speakers have mentioned, one of the challenges we're facing today is the fact that with these shifting um, environmental aspects like global warming, uh, extreme weather events, et cetera, some of the current uh, infrastructures that we have are being rendered either inefficient or downright dangerous to current society. So I'll move forward and talk a bit more about the impact of extreme weather on community design. So I've highlighted some of the primary changes you can see people will make when either updating or implementing new assets of community like new buildings or conducting urban planning. So there are obvious changes in the construction that need to be required as a result of extreme weather events or even greater natural disasters such as earthquakes. For an example, fire codes are obviously important now that we have such, I would say, prominent wildfires. There needs to be modifications made to pre-existing or historical buildings, such as making them more energy efficient or, for instance, insulating buildings that haven't had that before. There are frequently regulations placed on resource usage, like how much um, water can be utilized by a building, how much water can be utilized in landscaping, things like that. And there also need to be emergency management plans put in place on a city level or a community level for events like flooding, hurricanes, wildfires, et cetera. I've chosen to highlight this using a case study. Um, the location is Ellicott City near Washington, DC. And I chose it because it's one of the areas that first made me aware of the importance of building a resilient and sustainable community as I'm somewhat local to Ellicott City and I have family who live very near there. Ellicott City experienced two major floods relatively recently on July 30th, 2016 and May 27th, 2018. The first flood resulted in two deaths and the second flood resulted in one. Um, Ellicott City experienced these major floods due to several contributing factors, mainly that it was originally built in the 1800s at confluence of multiple streams, which at the time were very small and dealt with by building historic waterways under Main Street. Some new developments surrounding the town, while not increasing the size of the streams, decreased the amount of potential ways for groundwater to penetrate. So they would do things like convert um, permeable ground cover to paver, paved roads or new houses, which resulted in, while the streams didn't increase in size regularly, they would increase in size quite drastically during flooding. Or, I'm saying, during extreme weather events such as major thunderstorms. The town, as I mentioned, was located in a valley and when they experienced major thunderstorms, which increased the size of streams leading into the waterways under Main Street, they obviously experienced significant damage. So I've brought in a couple of examples. The one on the left is from FEMA talking about how the main street of the town was damaged. It experienced historic levels of flooding and destroyed much of the historic main street, including dragging the tree inside of the building and destroying cars. And as I mentioned, it did experience multiple deaths. This highlights a bit more of the increase uh, in flooding around the US. Obviously, while Ellicott City is one example, this is some easily accessible data from the National Climate Assessment, National Climate Assessment Report. And it highlights just the, how this is becoming a national problem on the US level and a international problem abroad. And you can see what's precipitating those claims. There's major changes in extreme precipitation in the late 21st century, forecasted again by the um, Annual Climate Assessment Report. And I want to highlight again, it's extreme precipitation. Some of these areas can still experience droughts, which leads to wildfires or water restrictions while still experiencing extreme or freak thunderstorms that would cause devastation like the type I highlighted. 
And extreme weather is a worldwide problem. I've highlighted a couple more prominent examples from the last couple years. The one at the top right is Venice, Italy, which is experiencing some significant flooding due or routinely experiences significant flooding, flooding due to climate change linked factors such as increased thunderstorms and changes in local climate patterns altering flood patterns due to the warmth of the water. On the bottom left is ongoing flooding in Kentucky right now. Again, this is not particularly common for the area, but it's an extreme weather event that ha obviously has to be dealt with and managed. And the top right is a example of how we can still experience these flooding events and extreme weather, sorry, extreme thunderstorms and experience drought. That's Lake Mead and the depth has dropped over 20 years. In fact, that's been declining since the 1980s. And that visual is from NASA. So there's a few primary issues in developing solutions to these issues. Some of them are underlying infrastructure issues, like I highlight, highlighted in the Ellicott City case study, there, the way that water was initially routed through the town developed issues. And in other situations, this can be extrapolated to wildfires, um, hurricanes, et cetera. The current infrastructure is not sustainable in these areas and needs to be reassessed to better support a resilient community that can rebound from these disasters. There's also historic and cultural value that raises some problems in these areas. In towns like, for instance, Ellicott City or for Venice or really anywhere that has historic value attached to some of the buildings that would need to be altered or some of the terrain that would need to be altered, people are going to want to ensure both preservation of anything with historical cultural, cultural value to them while still not continuing full steam ahead with a community that's going to be non-resilient towards these disasters. And finally, there's political conflict. And this can obviously be in areas where there's active violence or strife to deal with um, uh, environmental issues, but this can also be on a level like interstate water disputes, for instance, what's going on with the Colorado water river rights, where Colorado river water rights, where the water coming out of the Colorado river is sourced, is a source of water for multiple different states who all have their own desires for using water. So there's a few ways to actually implement resilient infrastructure. And the first I'd like to highlight is awareness of environmental risk factors in new construction. As I mentioned, you need to be aware of, depending on your environment, heat or drought, flooding, what plans, what your plans for development will do to alter that environment and trends in extreme weather that, while you may not have to deal with now, are a reality for your, your planned community within the next several decades. This leads into contextual analysis, which is a systems engineering principle where you need to thoroughly analyze the impact that any of these developments is going to have on your planned community. This the point that I'd like to highlight in particular for this is called stakeholder analysis, which Dr. Wells touched on a little bit. And that's essentially going through and making sure that this, is, this development or these alterations are concepts that have support from the community. You won't be able to convince anybody to either implement these issues or implement these solutions or support these solutions long-term and maintain them to make them sustainable if they aren't convinced that this will actually help or they are opposed to it for a cultural reason, a historic reason, et cetera. I've brought in a quote down at the bottom that I think summarizes this. This is from a hydrologist interviewed about the need to um, modify the historic district in Ellicott City to better support flooding. And it's that rebuilding decisions are not rational and you need to come up with an answer that satisfies the engineering specs and also the human needs. Because as we've highlighted so far today, um, human attitudes towards resilient infrastructure and redevelopment or change of this infrastructure is going to be just as much of a factor as the actual needs to rebuild and the ability to do so. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and conclude and pass it off to our next speaker.
Thank you. Um, that's uh, a lot of wonderful information, which we'll uh, dive deeper into during the uh, Q&A. Uh, but before that, we do have our last speaker and uh, joining us uh, from Cape May, New Jersey is Dr. John Francis. Uh, Dr. Francis has a quite, you know, well, everyone's got a unique uh, history, but uh, I've always been enthralled and fascinated by Dr. Francis. Uh, he was also known as the uh, Planet Walker. Um, Dr. Francis uh, spent uh, 17 years of, uh, of not speaking. And I know the uh, a couple of times in our presentations uh, noted the importance of listening. Um, that's been a key theme uh, for Dr. Francis over the time, over those years. Um, and uh, he also spent, I believe, 22 years uh, of uh, refusing to ride any motorized vehicle, having uh, received uh, a degree uh, at Southern Oregon University, uh, he then proceeded to walk uh, up to Washington State, uh, built a boat, and then contacted the University of Maryland, where he sailed and walked uh, to Missoula, where he eventually earned a uh, master's degree. He then walked uh, round about around the United States and ended up at the uh, University of Wisconsin in Madison, where he received a uh, PhD in land management. Uh, Dr. Francis has been involved with Star Tides uh, even before the founding of Star Tides uh, and, and uh, initiatives uh, preceding uh, the, the current program, the Knowledge Sharing Network. Uh, Dr. Francis recently uh, made his uh, first um, visit to Africa, to the African continent, with a trip to Tanzania. And uh, he is a uh, noted author including uh, his latest book, uh, Human Kindness, True Stories of Compassion and Generosity That Changed the World. Uh, Dr. Francis, I'll turn it to you uh, to kind of bring our thoughts together, uh, provide your unique perspective. And you are, there you go. Okay. Um, Aaron, thank you very much, and I want to thank all the speakers um, for their wonderful presentations. Uh, I learned so much from, from all of you, and uh, uh, especially Lynn, thank you for uh, always inviting me to um, your amazing programs. Uh, it's the beginning of Strong Angel and uh, serving as a uh, ethical advisor. I, I've learned so much from uh, being a part of your life and the programs that you have uh, brought forth. Um, I, I want to just go back a, a, a little bit to, uh, you know, uh, to, to talk about uh, how this journey started for me, which was uh, seeing an oil spill. And so that was the first uh, insult, environmental insult that I personally saw. And, you know, we were talking about uh, how community, what community resilience looks like. So my first, uh, I, I guess, experience with uh, the environment, environmental problems that are happening was my individual response. Uh, and that was to just give up riding in motorized vehicles because of the oil that I saw washing on the shore and the birds that were dying and the sea life that was impacted. It affected me so, so much that I had to do something and that was to, to give up riding in cars. Soon after that, uh, and I, I want to get to this place of, well, why did you stop talking and what was that about? Because that's a big question. But soon after that, um, I ended up arguing with people about whether one person could make a difference. And this happened in, back in 1971, and the environment really wasn't such a big thing. I mean, uh, it was, uh, there wasn't an Earth Day yet, you know? And, and so people really didn't know. And if I talked about environment, it seemed like something really crazy. 
And so on my 27th birthday, uh, I decided that I wouldn't speak for, for one day. And Lynn, you'll appreciate this because that's when I learned that uh, I had not been listening. <laughs> I just thought that I knew everything. I was 27 and I'm sure that everything I, that I already knew was about everything there was for me to, to learn. And so uh, that day prompted me to go for another day and <laughs> another day. And so I ended up not speaking for a year and decided that, um, that I was learning so much. Each year I would ask myself, uh, was listening uh, still something that was appropriate for me? And so it was for 17 years that I decided that I, I needed to really listen. And as I walked across America, uh, I just listened to the people around me. And, and, and it was such an education, along with a formal education, as you mentioned, Aaron, that I did go to university in Oregon and Montana and uh, at the University of Wisconsin to receive my PhD. It was actually at the um, University of Montana when I was teaching a class silently, I didn't speak, uh, that I understood that uh, if you were a teacher, that if, and when you mentioned this, that if you were teaching and you weren't learning, you probably weren't being a very good teacher because it is a two-way thing. I mean, we, uh, we learn from our students, we learn from each other, and we're all watching each other and we're all learning and teaching each other. So uh, this is a huge classroom that we're all in. And I'm so glad to be part of this classroom with you because I'm learning so much about the, the things, the science, the policies that we need to incorporate in our lives and in order to make a difference, in order to save our planet, in order to uh, make a meaningful change in what's happening with the climate right now. Uh, and, uh, and Lynn, I, I, I want to make this something lasting. <laughs> So, so that it goes on, uh, you know, after us old guys, you know, we're, <laughs> I know we don't last forever, but, you know, let's hopefully the planet is going to be here uh, longer than, you know, just a few more years. Okay, Madeline, it, Madeline, it's all on you. <laughs> all right, um, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> so, so, um, there are some things that, that were said that, you know, right here in New Jersey, for example, the, the, we're probably in, the, in North America sinking on the East Coast faster than any place else in the, on the continent. And it's hard to get people to understand that. Uh, especially I live here on a little island and we're sinking and sinking and sinking. And we're talking about, well, let's build a, uh, a a seawall <laughs> to keep us from well those are good solutions i mean i i understand that build back better and build stronger and all those things but what i'm getting at and what i learned after walking across the united states and studying environment all the way up to a phd level is that uh, environment is really about people. And I think you all said that, that it's about people and policy and, you know, uh, climate change. I remember when I started, it was just about uh, pollution. That's why I started walking, pollution. And, and then uh, it was loss of habitat and loss of species and, and uh, climate change hadn't happened yet. <laughs> I mean, it was happening, but no, it was not on our radar. And the, the, the last thing that we were talking about as I was walking was nuclear war and nuclear proliferation. And we're all concerned about that. And uh, we're still concerned about it. We're living in a world where we have to really think about something like that happening. And maybe a few years ago, we weren't. 
you know, and now because of what's going on in our world, it's back on our radar again. And the, the mad, the mutually assured destruction that was set in place and we thought that no one would do such a thing uh, is now front and center. Uh, I, I just finished writing this book and, and thank you very much, Aaron, for mentioning that book uh, because as I walked across the United States, uh, what I discovered uh, that was the baseline of my survival was people's kindness to me because I walked through all kinds of states, red and blue and purple with all kinds of people with different ideas that were different from mine. And at each place, uh, people treated me with kindness and respect and, and generosity, you know, letting me in their homes and uh, finding a place for me to sleep at night, meals. Uh, I, I did carry a banjo and maybe that was a, a, a big <laughs> reason uh, that, that, I ha that happened. But I think the first thing was that I didn't speak and I listened, that I listened to every person as if they mattered. And, and I think that's something that we're going to have to do because it seems we're at such a loggerhead that we're not listening to each other. If we just listen to each other, I, I think that's a, a way, it's, it's a first step. It's a first step. And when I decided what, what, what environment was, I, I came up with the idea that environment was all those things. It was about pollution and climate change and loss of species and habitat, all those things were environmental issues that we have to concern ourselves with. And Dr. Lasky, you mentioned that uh, poverty is going to be a big thing. You know, there are going to be more people going into poverty if, if we don't change things. And so that was part of what I discovered is that environment was about people and how we treated each other, how we treated each other. So it became all the things that we talked about today. And it also became about human rights and civil rights and gender equality and economic equity and all the ways that we relate to each other. And that I feel is, needs to be at the base, the foundation of all the work that we do to address all the environmental issues, including climate change. Those things need to be the foundation of our action, our climate actions. And so I'm, I'm glad to, to be here. Uh, there's so much to say uh, about all the, the things that, you know, Madeline, that you, you brought up and uh, I, I'm so familiar with uh, Ellicott City, having walked there and with the, with the rivers that, what is that river, the Puget? It's not the Puget River, it's Patuxent? Is that the Patuxent? Patuxent yes. Yes, it's, uh, you know, um, how important all that is and how vulnerable uh, we all are uh, with what's happening now. Um, I'm gonna stop there. And I'm be looking forward to the conversation uh, that we're going to have uh, following this. So thank you very much, and uh, looking forward to our conversation. You know, thank you, Dr. Francis. Um, I do want to uh, turn the uh, floor back over to uh, Dr. Thornton. Uh, you got cut off, and uh, so I uh, would like to. Uh, let you finish up your remarks, yes. and then we'll we'll go into uh, some uh, further discussion uh, collectively. Go go ahead. Thank you so much. I'm going to leave my video off just in case that's also tying up the Wi-Fi. So not only do we have water issues in Mississippi, we also have Wi-Fi issues as well. Imagine that. In any case, in focusing about these environmental concerns as it relates to water crises that we are seeing pop up all over the world, and more recently in the United States with Flint and other issues around Washington, D.C., whether it be flooding, whether it be droughts, uh, as um, 
you know, others have noted in Colorado. Um, Jackson has historically been obviously the center for failing infrastructure, systemic racism, and a lot of other issues that are social, political, and cultural, not just environmental. And so when you have the intersection of all of those at play, of course, there's going to be this push and pull as to what occurs and when it occurs. And so um, not only has this crisis been very catastrophic, not only to the water infrastructure system itself, but also the divisions, the, 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 the further divisions and, and political trust and, and, and social capital, as well as, you know, other things have been raised. I mean, schools had to shut down. Restaurants couldn't serve any food without, you know, bottled water. What was the cost of bottled water? What was the, um, what are the implications of access? activating 600 members of the National Guard, where was money being spent that was allocated to this issue years ago, as well as a recent lawsuit that got settled with Siemens Engineering just a few years ago. So, you know, it's also about government accountability um, and then, you know, uh, the electing of the officials in terms of you get the government you deserve at times. And that sounds very harsh, but in reality, if your citizens aren't educated enough to know who is at the table and making these key decisions and where they're putting the money, um, that it's going to always end up with a lack of potential transparency, accountability, and fraud. And so now the question is, is where is the $400 million that has been designated from ARPA funds going to be allocated throughout the state, but also with the FEMA declaration, where is that money going to be allocated and how and what additional monies is the state? going to put towards this problem because it it, it 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 will occur again. I mean, what was it just uh, two Fridays ago, they got two days worth of clear water. And so imagine going an entire month and one of the hottest months of the year and throughout the capital of the Mississippi, the seat of power, uh, which also has one of the highest populations and all you're living off of is water from bottles. You can't drink from it. You can't wash from it. You can't wash your clothes. They didn't. They encourage you don't even wash. You know, like clean your pet. So the fact that we are still dealing with severe water issues, whether it is from failing infrastructure and the environmental contaminants that are related to it, or if there's a flood exacerbating the failing infrastructure, because that was also a concern in this case. What can we? learn from this lesson and do a better job with the next to get ahead. Because as I started the conversation off with is, okay, what is it gonna cost us? What is it really going to cost us in a do nothing scenario? So I'll leave it there for now. Very good. Um, somewhat depressing, but uh, let's uh, focus on some optimism here. Um, Sorry to leave you all on the, 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 the back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, quite all right. Um, during a, the most recent uh, Star Tides advisory board meeting, there was a side conversation really talking about, you know, it's almost become a, a, a tug of war between climate adaptation and climate resilience um, and, mit and, and almost, you know, and mitigation. Um, I do want to throw this question out and maybe to uh, first to uh, Dr. Lasky uh, and, and, and get uh, your, your thoughts about that. And how do we balance, I mean, I, you, you know, looking at both the, 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 the reports and the conversation throughout the last few weeks at the United Nations, and I've attended other sessions of the Science Summit, um, that push and pull, that tug of war is becoming more profound. On the policy level, I know there's you know discussions from the U.S. Congress about you know what do we fund um, and 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 if you have to prioritize um, in in the private sector, you know I I, I listen to what investors are are putting you know uh, capital to, in. I see startups and what they're investing in. Um, bigger companies and their R and D budgets. There's a question of well. Should we focus more on climate adaptation? Um, so I really want to kind of throw that out uh, for any of the speakers, but to uh, uh, maybe Dr. Lasky first and then to uh, Dr. Wells, and then if others have uh, comments. Well, let me let me say that thank you for the thank you for an excellent question, Aaron, because that's something that I've seen discussed more and more recently. I think that until 
a few years ago, there was a reluctance to discuss adaptation because it was people would even get angry at you if you tried to talk about adaptation because they would say you're throwing your hands up and admitting defeat. Um, and so I think that, that some of the new, dis new more recent discussions of adaptation is a realization that, um, that we're not, regardless of what we do on the reduction of emissions, the things that we're seeing now more and more are going to get worse for the next decade at least, even if we just, even if we had a rapid reduction in emissions. And so we do need to invest in, in adaptation because otherwise uh, we're gonna be really in trouble. Um, but on the other hand, if we then suddenly switch gears and say, oh, we're just, we're gonna forget about reduction. We're gonna, we're gonna just deal with adaptation. Um, that will put us in a scenario, a truly horrific scenario. So I think we have to do both, but I think that there is a really difficult decision on allocating resources. But I also want to harken back to what Tanya just said, Dr. Thornton just said, um, the cost of doing nothing. So we need to invest in both adaptation and reduction. And I think that we need to acknowledge and admit to ourselves that that if we don't make those investments, the outcomes will be immeasurably worse. And we need to be, we need to be, um, to, to be honest with ourselves about what the costs are of doing nothing. But the, then I'd, I'd like to push one more point there. Um, Cause we, like you said to, to Dr. Thornton, um, uh, thanks for the, <laughs> thanks for the uh, uh, difficult, you know, th that um, we've been sounding very pessimistic here. Um, there was, I, on, on Twitter earlier today, I read about a, uh, a person who was at a climate change conference and said, okay, everybody, if you think we're going to make the climate change, you know, the, the goals that we have set up for this city, raise your hand. And one person raised their hand up partially and then put it back down again. And the rest of the room stayed silent. Um, and the, the comment from the person who posted this was that um, if we if we can't get a sense of can-do optimism in our society, we are really in trouble. It's it's uh, th that we're we're basically we don't want to admit defeat. We need to roll up our sleeves and start working. Whether it's on adaptation, whether it's on uh, mitigation. Whatever it is, we but we need to work together, and we need to regain a sense of agency, a sense of there is something we can do, but we have to act collectively. And I think it's really important to avoid sort of just sort of sitting down, s s d deciding that that we're we're hosed, so we might as well not do anything. Very good, uh, Dr. Wells. Would like to get your thoughts on the question, please. The very end of this I heard just the other day was that. Um, you go ahead and mitigate uh, all you want, uh, do what you can, uh, but the the gist of the you know, political dynamics and the amount of uh, uh, the amount of carbon-based fuel is going to have to be burned during the transition as such means that we're we're never going to make 1.5, uh, and so the key is don't give up on mitigation, but start training your children and grandchildren to adapt. And you know, what does that mean? Just, just, just have them begin to understand what the world of three or four degrees is going to be like, and begin to think about what their future is going to be like in that world. Again, it doesn't say give up, try to do what you can, but just recognize we're already perhaps past a, a, a tipping point uh, for uh, a lot of the projections that are already out there. Very good. Dr. Thornton, uh, other speakers, uh, thoughts on this question? Sure. I really appreciate Dr. Wells' comment in terms of we start training our children and our grandchildren. And in a lot of ways, our children are too far gone to kind of understand, you know, the, the real touchstones of what this adaptation should look like, what this change should look like. I mean, I know that I've worked well with my family in terms of trying to recycle, trying to compost, trying to talk about the global population. Mm -hmm. Where is it increasing? How fast is it increasing? And it's not just about the global population. It's also about food resources and pets 
Every, every, you, you think about our global population, I'm doing a lot of research right now on how the pet population is increasing alongside our population. But what are some of the other things we can do to reduce that footprint? And so many people will say, we'll drive electric cars. Okay, well, what's the cost of that? Um, at the end of the day, we're gonna start having to see and have serious conversations about how to reduce the global population. That's going to, to probably go against a, a lot of politics and religion, but really, you know, the earth will win in the next series of disasters. And at the end of the day, we need to do as much as we can to prevent that from happening, but also have conversations that are going to be tough around trying to limit the population. Very good. <clears throat> Anything else on this uh, question? Hearing none. Um, CRASC actually uh, also hosts a lunch and learn uh, series. And uh, in this past, uh, this last week, um, there was a, <laughs> a, a speaker um, uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Bree Haupt from uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, who gave a very fascinating presentation about cross-sector co uh, collaboration with the public health department and really talking about the, the challenges of finding trusted authorities. So, and, and, and the notion of fake news isn't unique to the United States. You know, the, 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 it, it, it's prevalent in, in Europe, uh, it's prevalent in, in Asia, uh, you know, where, where you have censors, uh, a lot of media is, is censored uh, in certain parts of Asia. Um, and um, even in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, in my, throughout my career, I've seen a, a change in how information is published and shared within the media. What opportunities or challenges does that create when it comes to uh, mobilizing people, um, either with the notion of resilience or adaptation in really filtering through trusted <clears throat> sources, trusted information, um, either from government agencies, uh, governing bodies like the UN, uh, or you know, or from uh, other actors. Um, this question really, you know, can go for for anyone here on the panel. So, I mean, is the, the, I mean, there's a comment that's been made about Russia for a while. That basically, uh, the, the basic premise is uh, uh, nothing is true, anything is possible. And so, if you if you really want to uh, provide yourself with the maximum amount of not only freedom of action but plausible deniability, it becomes a consciously kind of strategy, you just make sure you have three or four or five alternative explanations for anything that happens. And you just leave people with a sense of, hmm, well, that's, that's possible. Maybe that's true. And not knowing in essence what state to drive in the ground as to what they believe in. Um, I guess the question is, has anybody seen an example? And I don't know of one where, um, and this is, of course, amplified by the echo chambers in which we all live in terms of uh, listening for news from sources that we trust, which reinforce the information that we get and, um, and demonize the other side. But the question is where somebody has been able to uh, establish sort of a ground truth or at least a, a, a um, broadly based cross-cutting narrative that uh, is considered credible by some percent of the population, but a large percent of the population. It's clearly not happening in the United States, but there are other countries, I don't know, New Zealand comes to mind as a place where it happened, or the Netherlands or somewhere like that. Uh, have they seen anyone, and what lessons can we learn from that? Or... Thank you. Other speakers? Well, one, you know, one of the things that, that um, has occurred to me is that this is this is problem that we that we're facing right now uh, isn't going to be solved today or tomorrow. Uh, this is long term, and so 
you know, I, I appreciate uh, Dr. Lesky talking about um, adaptation as well. And Lynn, I think you mentioned this too, adaptation uh, as well as trying to, uh, to reduce and, and, and hit that, that climate goal. Uh, it, we're not gonna actually do one, we have to do both. And if we're going to educate ourselves to start looking at the, you know, what's the credible source? Are there any credible source? You know, we're, we're going to need to look at educating ourselves or our children into learning how to think critically. And I don't think that we're doing that now. So uh, critical thinking, I think, is going to be, uh, you know, really an important uh issue that's going to have to come up where someone says, oh, okay, I hear this, I hear this, I, I, and this sounds good, I'd like to believe this, but I really don't have the evidence for that, you know, and to look for the evidence to uh, support what it is uh, you would like to believe or find out that, hey, I can't, I can't find the evidence to support that, I can only find the evidence to support something else. Uh, and so I think critical thinking is something that we're going to have to, you know, put in our our school system. We're going to have to teach our children how to think critically. And if we don't put it in our school systems, we have to teach them at home. So that's a. Thank you. Let me turn to question. Uh, before you pour me that, uh, Aaron, just to amplify, I heard a very, interesting, very, I thought, thoughtful uh, discussion recently between two long-term friends mm -hmm. who wound up on opposite sides of the you know, recent political divide in the United States. And what they finally came to conclude was, well, we've known each other for a long time. We like each other. We respect each other. Um, and so how do we continue this? And, and the solution they came up with was when an issue, when one or the other would raise an issue, the answer was, why do you find that argument compelling? Not, you know, uh, you know blankety blank New York Times or Breitbart or whatever, but just you know, why do you find that compelling? And led to, in almost every case, a, a reasonable and interesting discussion. So some kind of approach like that might be useful in some cases. Yeah, it used to be that uh, I remember a uh, public speaking course that I took, you know, many years ago where you know, the notion of rhetoric uh, was about, you know, learning. Again, the notion, you know, the, the, the operative term of public speaking was listening um, and, uh, and, and hearing the arguments. Um, you know, it, it's now not just about proving, you know, that, that the speaker is right, but it's, you know, speaking is in red, political rhetoric and discourse has turned into, uh, you know, proving that the listener, the other side is wrong. Um, so we, we seem to have gotten away uh, from the basic principles of, of uh, political rhetoric and discussion. Um, I wanna pose this question specifically to, uh, to uh, Ms. Haas and, uh, you know, recognizing uh, her perspective of, of a younger generation. But uh, with that said, you know, what, what are some of the, underlying issues, uh, you, you know, when it, when it comes to, you know, when you talk with your friends and classmates uh, of, of looking at, again, resilience and, and climate mitigation, um, you know, is, is, there, is there a sense of, of priorities of what or, or what should be prioritized uh, either on the policy level I mean, you and, and, and your classmates are looking at careers um, and, and how to leverage your, your current experience into a, a future career in a specific field. Um, but when it comes to systems engineering, I mean, what, what is kind of the discussion that you think, you know, policymakers uh, should be aware of um, and key decision makers, you know, whether it is from uh, public sector or from the private sector? Sure. So I will start off by saying that I'll address your first point about what my peers or classmates or younger coworkers think. And I think that I believe Dr. Lasky and Dr. Wells had points about 
almost defeatist attitudes. Like I recognize that this is obviously a serious situation and there's in some ways there's no possible method to reverse some of the impacts of climate change or extreme weather events. But I do think that when you're having a conversation involving multiple um, if not generations, then maybe people from a diverse background, you need to recognize that th saying, for instance, that something is irreversible and can't be changed and notably can't be improved isn't the most conducive to actually facilitating solutions and encouraging people to involve themselves in it. Because I think that that pushes people, especially younger people, to think, oh, well, if this is irreversible and can't be medicated, then I'm better off doing something else. Because if you're looking at a career with 50, 60 years ahead of you, then you're, why would you want to allocate those 50, 60 years to something that can't be fixed or is pointless? And I'm not saying that in this conversation we've highlighted that, oh, this is a issue that can't be resolved. But I think that a lot of messaging targeted towards the population in general does highlight that, oh, we've already gone past the point of no return. To address your second point about how I think systems engineering involvement and in, what I think about systems engineering involvement and in, uh, climate change and building communities that will face that, I think that systems engineering is really well positioned to address that because it encourages you to think carefully about what the community is, what it wants, and how to effectively implement that solution. Uh, Dr. Lasky and Dr. Wells both brought up the fact that we need to work with the people in the community that is having the issue, identify solutions that they can feasibly implement, want to implement, and are willing to sustain, and that we communicate that to them effectively. Dr. Wells in particular highlighted that we can't just go in and announce that, oh, we're the scientists, we're the engineers, we're the policymakers, and we know everything. We have to emphasize that first, that we want to work with them. And second, we have to take advice. And this is an engineering principle called um, context analysis. And on a more specific level, stakeholder analysis, you have to make sure that you're taking their input as well. There may be things that they know, whether through um, just common knowledge in their area, perspectives they have on their culture or their environment that they have, you don't, and are critical to implementing an effective solution. Thank you for that. Um, Absolutely. Let me pose the next question to Dr. Thornton. Uh, back to kind of your experience and both professional experience and what you're, you know, experiencing in Mississippi in the last few weeks of um, responsibility, uh, you know, looking for uh, outside in about the, uh, uh, the water issues in Mississippi, and even not just the current, but even the rebuilding after Katrina. Uh, I remember there was, you know, you know, you know, who takes responsibility for the rebuild uh, there on, on the Gulf Coast and, and Bluxy and 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 Gulf and um, and Pasigula and, and uh, uh, elsewhere. Um, even here in in the Western United States, I mean, I'm literally uh, one ridge away from Lake Mead. I'm in Las Vegas, Nevada, and literally a bit of a walk. I could be on the shores of Lake Mead, and you know, and and the the four or five cities that or states that's involved with. Uh, you know, that has responsibility of the uh, of the uh, Colorado River and the watershed, um, you know, deadline is passed. You know, there was, you know, there's states were supposed to come up with their uh, reductions of water usage. Uh, states failed to do that. You know, is it going to be, you know, will the federal government have to institute uh, the policy to in, in, in how do you make that binding? Um, so, uh, you know, Dr. Thornton, I guess the question really is, is that, you know, looking more positively, how can, you know, what does policy, where does policy play a role in this in becoming, you know, binding and self-sustaining? So I'm so glad that you asked this question, Erin, only because, you know, my dissertation focused on Hurricane Katrina and the Deepwater Horizon oil spill and all of the counties that were located on the northern coast, Gulf Coast, along with one county or parish deep. 
And what was interesting, it wasn't, it didn't matter based on your demographics, your religion, education, income, really even your location, your political affiliation, more than 75% of individuals surveyed, and this was a, a mixed landline cell phone scientific survey for NOAA, it found that more than 75% of respondents felt that the federal government was responsible for taking care of victims and their families following a major disaster. Not insurance companies, not personal savings, not nonprofits, but the federal government. But in the same breath, these are the same individuals that refuse to do a fourth quarter cent of a sales and increase in sales tax at the local level to help offset some of those costs. I think we're seeing that that sense of that expanding sense of entitlement just in terms of the federal government always stepping in and um, to 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 save individuals from things from happening. We are seeing it most notably now, even with COVID-19 and <clears throat> going impacts that's going to have to our, um, our economic security. Um, really, at the end of the day, it's going to take some pretty significant changes to how policy is made and what it means to hold policymakers, at especially the local and state levels, uh, uh, you know, uh, feet to the ground in terms of implementing these changes instead of just rewarding but at the same time, we don't want our states to fall apart either. So there's no easy solution because, you know, that's why we have FEMA to step in when we have these, these overwhelming disasters that um, make it impossible for local uh, governments to be able to effectively respond. Then that overwhelms the resources at the state level. But if they're also not investing in these things themselves and, and actually, say, you know, conforming with what the requirements are, or what the reporting mechanisms are, you see this everywhere and every state is, is um, doing this, then I don't really know how we could stop the state from eating its tail. It's going to have to be a fundamental shift in how we think in terms of public policy and how that policy is executed at all levels of government. And so um, it's just a lot more talk and a lot less action. I know that that was a really bad song at one point, but it is what it is. Um, I don't have a really great answer for you, but. But it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of education, especially among those who are elected in these um, positions at all levels, because it doesn't mean that they have tactical, operational or strategic intelligence or competence in all things related to every type of disaster, let alone everything that they have to govern. And so if you run and you're elected, oh, wait, now you have to actually govern. And so that's a significant step for a lot of individuals. Thank you for that. Let me pose the next question to Dr. Francis and, and from the uh, ethical uh, perspective. Um, I've got experience uh, of working with the uh, uh, sovereign country in the Pacific Ocean, uh, the Federal States of Micronesia. And, and, uh, and right now, um, the Compact of Free Associations being uh, negotiated, the extension of that. And one of the things that's coming up is that how do you, you know, how, and, and Dr. Wells raised this in his presentation, um, how do you allow the, and enable the local people to both create and implement solutions that to, in the sense of climate resilience um, versus you know, an, an outside entity like the United States government to come in and, and say, you know, this is what you're doing and this is how you're going to do it and this is when you're going to do it. Um, you know, in, in a country like the Maldives, um, you know, a, again, that that tug, that tug of war um, is these, is these you know, or, or Karabash, another, another place in the South Pacific, but the Maldives and the Indian Ocean. Um, and, and how, you have that struggle between letting the local population set their policies and create actions, but then if, if inaction is, becomes paralyzing for the policymakers, then how do you balance that out with outside entities? And so I want to get your sense, um, Dr. Francis, from the ethics point of view, um, how do, what are the ethical implications of that balance? Um, and because if inaction becomes paralyzing, obviously that's a harm to, to the people. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot, of, a lot of cases, a lot of examples where inaction has cost lives. Um, so how do we, what, do, what should we be looking at 
from an ethicist perspective. Let me unmute you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a really good question, Aaron. And um, I'm, I'm not sure I have the answer. Uh, I, I attended a, a conference, um, a SIDS conference, Small Islands in Developing States uh, in uh, the, the 90s back in, I guess it was in uh, Barbados. And uh, I think that from my sense of that conference, um, that many of the islands are, they're on the forefront of experiencing what's happening with climate change and sea level rise. And so uh, they already know what we uh, here uh, think we know or are beginning to understand. They already know that. And so <laughs> I, I, I think that the, the problem that they have had and the problem that they were uh, putting forth at that conference, which was, you know, it's several a decade ago, several decades ago, was that, hey, we're sinking, <laughs> can you help us? And so they already, they're looking for help and uh, we're, we're not responding. So I think uh, what has to happen now from my, from my experiences is that we have to offer them the capability to make the changes that they already are seeing need to be made. Dr. Wells, from your perspective, taking that question over to you, from your perspective, both as a uh, as a naval officer and as well as a uh, uh, as a government official uh, for so long, you know, how is the balance from either a national or there lessons that we can learn that was applied in national security? Uh, I guess from a national security and and from a defense perspective uh, that can be applied to today's situation when it comes to uh, climate uh, resilience and adaptation? Well, I think Admiral Locklear, the Indo PACOD, then Pacific yeah. Command Commander, um, raised this, uh, oh, about 2015 or so, and was absolutely savage, but it raised the national, sorry, climate change as a national security issue. And it was absolutely savage by the Congress for having uh, dared to speak that. I think DOD is now at uh, the forefront of an awful lot of climate change issues because they really do recognize just how serious this is. Everything from the flooding of U.S. bases, particularly the bases as as uh, Dr. Francis said on the East Coast, uh, where the East Coast is sinking, the sea levels are rising. So the bases in the Tidewater and off at Langley Air Force Base so on and so forth are particularly at risk. In addition, uh, the the whole issue of climate change driven migration uh, and uh, the potential for conflicts over uh, scarcening resources uh, become very quickly national security issues. Uh, and then uh, finally, we have states that just may disappear in some cases with the Compact of Free Association where the uh, populations have the right to migrate to the United States if need be. Uh, how does that get uh, mitigated? And Part of the issue that uh, was raised uh, decades ago, they were thinking about this and they saw it. And that's different than being able to decide on action. And I think if you look in some cases, the action that they perceive is, well, we're not to blame for this. You developed countries are to blame for this. So send us more money, uh, which is not necessarily the answer. Uh, the Dutch, I was part of a conference about two years ago, and some people from Holland basically said, look, by 2100, almost every major city in Holland is going to have to be afloat. We cannot keep building the dikes and the seawalls and all that higher and higher and higher against the North Sea. And it turns out there's some extraordinary innovative work being done right now on floating cities. There's a prototype in I think French Polynesia, there's another one being built in Korea, they're talking about one in Hong Kong, that actually might uh, provide a way to uh, address reasonably large populations adjacent to coastal waters. So the trick is not that they're not good ideas, the trick is how do you get people to escape from their uh, traditional mindset that says, well, uh, we're just going to keep 
you know, doing it the way we've always done it and hope that the problem will be fixed by the time the next generation get here because we're not going to solve it in our generation. So it's, it's that critical thinking piece, I think, that's really missing. And too often the solution is just, you know, throw more money at it. The final point is someone once told me that the, 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 you can, the, the, the unique or the universal model of a briefing in the U.S. executive branch is this is a really tough problem. We're doing a pretty good job at it, but we'd do better if you give us more money. And you can morph that into just about any topic from uh, defense spending to housing, uh, housing and urban development to climate change, whatever. And that's not the solution. Right. Well, thank you for that. Um, other responses before we move on to the next question? Maybe just to, it's a, one more one last point, which is there's a, there's a quote that's often attributed to Lord Rutherford, um, the famous British physicist back around the turn of the 18th, 19th, 20th century, and basically he was running a laboratory and he said, well, gentlemen, we're out of money, now we must think. <laughs> and, I, I think there's a lot to be said for that. But my own my own observation is there's a lot more innovation in the lean times than there is in the fat times. So was it Winston Churchill who said the Americans always do the right thing after they've tried everything else first? Uh, yeah, and I think uh, Marlene Dietrich. Maybe, we, maybe we'll do the right thing eventually. Yeah, eventually. And the question is, uh, at what point is the, you know, I, I keep thinking about those poor people on the high rise down in Miami where they kept arguing about uh, whether they should increase the uh, uh, the monthly rental fee to pay for the repairs to the, uh, uh, to, to the building until time ran out. My husband's half brother died in that. Oh, my. Oh, well, we've got a few more. If anyone has any questions, I've got another one I want to pose. Um, and uh, and again, it's 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 the um, the solutions. Um, you know, Madeline uh, brought up some good points about um, you know the changes of new construction. Um, uh, I, I recently had a uh, meeting with a startup in Santa Clara, California, who has uh, redesigned uh, the, uh, the elevators, essentially the ele electric elevators. I mean, you know, like, like, like electrical vehicle. These are elevators that's ran, they're cableless, uh, they're ran on, on uh, battery. Um, and the idea is, is that you can reduce the cost of construction uh, as well as uh, the energy usage. Um, and we started talking about and how, you know, some cities around the world are, are literally rebuilding because of, of various environmental issues. Indonesia, uh, the capital of Indonesia, Jakarta, is sinking. Um, so they're looking at a mass rebuilding. Uh, Beijing uh, essentially moving most of their government offices uh, outside of, of the core of Beijing. Um, Cairo. Uh, is officially moving uh, their capital. Um, so uh, I guess the question is, is that how do we really incorporate innovation? Um, you know, governments have gotten bigger, whether no matter what you, you what political spectrum uh, you, you are, or what your beliefs are on the political spectrum, but governments worldwide have gotten bigger in size, budgets have gotten uh, bigger. Um, and one could argue that's just, you know, bigger government is here to stay. Um, certainly, you know, periodicals like The Economist says that. Um, so if that is true, again, you know, what is the role of government um, in order to incorporate sustainable solutions that come out of the private sector? Um, and uh, where in the United States, you know, we have DARPA, we have other, you know, the National Science Foundation, but but government support of the private sector is very different than some of the state-owned enterprises that you find um, in, and not just in, in East Asia, but even in Western Europe. You know, France, you know, has nationalized uh, their big energy company. Um, Germany is taking a more, a bigger stake in their uh, uh, energy processors 
in the grid. So, so I know it's a big question, but we are kind of like this this new era of of government size. But but how do we and and what's the accountability that needs to be put in in place uh, to really you know solve problems in a sustainable way? Hey, Aaron, yes. um, this is yeah, I don't have as much expertise in, in the energy security and grid security as it relates to this type of issue. I will say that in spending a month over in Abu Dhabi earlier this year, that there are serious talks and conversations underway with um, certain nuclear energy uh, commissions there or industry heads being the point of contact because the Middle East is going to activate or put online rather 16 new reactors for energy and an attempt to be more clean in the energy energy industry. But we all know that that also presents a number of resiliency and otherwise environmental issues. So I'll leave it at that just because this isn't my area, but I was in a specialized meeting that offered that up. So food for thought. Yeah, it's interesting because you talk about nuclear. I mean, for a long time, and it's become you know now you know in everyday news is you know how do you how does the, let's say the United States or other country any country have a you know, comprehensive energy solution without incorporating nuclear? Now, again, I'm sitting you know in the state of Nevada where you know Yucca Mountain um, you know was controversial. You mentioned nuclear now. Now you've got lithium mines. Uh, you know you want to. You know you want to. You know lose. You know reduce the dependence on other countries and lithium and the and the and nickel and cobalt um, that uh, is mined in, in other areas of the world. Um, so it um, not sure what the answer is, but there seems to be. You know, in, you know, utilizing my education and philosophy. You know, it starts with asking the right questions first, and I think that's what. Uh, what we need to do. But uh, Dr. Wells, uh, over to you, please. Yeah, so two things. First of all, um, Amory Lovins, who started uh, the Rocky Mountain Institute uh, energy-related uh, think and do tank, uh, makes a point about megawatts. And his point, if you're going to address energy issues, the first thing to do is to look at where you can reduce demand rather than increasing supply. And too often our thoughts are, oh, build more of this, build more of that. When in point of fact, you find a way to reduce demand, it's almost always the better solution to, to set a baseline that maybe you don't need to build all those new power plants. One. Two is there's some very interesting uh, technologies out there for doing a better job of tracking um, how funds are being spent. In making sure they wind up in the, uh, uh, making sure they wind up in the hands of the recipients. Uh, there's a, a, a company in Belgium, for example, uh, that essentially hands out a, a token, if you will, called Ucoin, which is a digital crypto secured token. But it's not a currency. You can't go out and spend it any way you want to. So what you do is uh, the Governor, the government of Antwerp or whoever says, all right, our goals this month are to increase uh, revenue for local merchants and to uh, promote healthy eating and help clean up the city. So the people who get these U coins can either spend Yo, is that at, Dick the local, Van Dyke? at the local merchant or. Yo, yo, Dick Van Dyke, I'm a huge fan of you. Hello? I'm a huge fan. Yo, can uh, I get your autograph? Somehow we've got uh, somebody cutting into the. Uh, yeah, I just I just kicked that person out. Go ahead. Okay. Anyway, uh, so the point is that um, you, you can, uh, if the if the coins are spent at the local merchant, then the money is sent directly to the local merchant. It's not given to somebody where they can go spend on drugs or alcohol or whatever. Uh, they're not redeemed. The, the government doesn't spend its money until it goes directly to the merchant whom it was intended to spend. And similarly, the um, uh, if people want to buy fruits and vegetables rather than Twinkies and Joel's, they can use these um, U coins for that without, um, uh, and again, promote that. Or if you want to use it to help clean up the city, people can get it for that. But the point is, there's pretty good ways now to do much better jobs of targeting how funds are being spent and tracking them. And I think that the combination of that plus megawatts of energy could be a useful way of doing business. Excellent. 
The, so, the, uh, one thing I'd like to throw in on the topic of nuclear energy, I mean, I think that all of us, a lot of people started, people who had been anti-nuke sort of started looking at nuclear energy as, okay, maybe we need to actually rethink this. Um, but then came the war in Ukraine. And um, the question of securing nuclear power plants against human conflict then comes up. Uh, it, it is a very serious concern. But on the other hand, maybe new, you know, nuclear energy may have to be one of our best hedges against climate change, but we have to really be concerned about sabotage. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think some of the new designs like pebble beds and things like that are much less vulnerable to uh, sort of catastrophic failure than the pressurized water reactors you're seeing it, um, in many of the current plants. So yeah, if you kept building the same kind of plants, you would certainly have that, but there may be opportunities with some of the new technologies to be safer as well. Very good. Um, I do know um, as far as a policy, one of the things that's come up, of course, that's been controversial because of the price of energy is that you know many governments are now capping the prices of energy and, and those governments then will pay uh, uh, the difference. The argument's been made, though, is that by capping the price of energy and keeping it artificially low, you, you de-incentivize usage. And maybe it's better to, you know, let the market dictate the price, the true price of energy. But then if you're going to do, you know, if the government's going to pay, then you do a cash transfer to those, the neediest, uh, that are, are impacted by the increase of energy. Um, I certainly don't. I certainly am not an economist, but uh, but I do know that uh, the the issue of uh, reducing the use of energy and make more fit more efficient use of the energy, uh, in my opinion, uh, gets uh, lost among uh, the, a lot of the noise that goes on into uh, these discussions. So. I guess uh, not looking whether people agree or disagree, but uh, I guess the last question is that's presenting the next question is that, you know, how do we look at, um, you, know, you know, using less energy? How do we get more products and how do we get society to use less energy? I mean, and, and again, you know, the developing world is developing. Um, you look at the uh, you know, energy that's going to be required for the urbanization that Sub-Saharan Africa is looking at, as well as in uh, other cities in South and Southeast Asia. Um, but, um, you know, what are some of the things we should be uh, mindful of? So that's to the floor. Um, that's the last question. Anyone wants to take it? Go ahead. Could I just ask that Dr. Francis, who spent so much of his life uh, uh, been affected by the, you know, the negative effects of oil spills and things like that, perhaps he has some views on this. Dr. Francis, go ahead, unmute, and uh, we're listening. Yeah, um, it, it's, a, it's an interesting question. And um, uh, my first, <laughs> my first, uh, uh, my first answer when someone would ask me, well, why are you walking? And I said, because I'm using less energy and I'm not contributing to oil spills. Of course, I understood that um, it didn't, you know, it, there was like, I still, I still ate at restaurants. I still bought my food from stores. I still did all these things. <laughs> I was living in an oil economy. And, and because I lived in the oil economy, I was reaping the benefits of that. And so there's, there's no way to, to really shift yourself out of it. I mean, you can ride your bike to work every day. And, uh, but if we, you know, I, I mean, though, I think those things are inspiring for us to, to look at and to get people to think about how can we reduce our energy consumption? I mean, now <laughs> I, I, I started flying all over the world and talking about reducing energy and I, one day I walked into the airport and the people at the counter said, congratulations, Dr. Francis. And I said, for what? And they said, 
you've flown over a million miles. I was like going, oh my God, <laughs> whatever I saved <laughs> walking, I just, you know, just blew that away. But I believe still, I believe firmly that the individual and we as individuals, we can inspire each other to do things and and not only inspire each other to do things in our individual and as an individual, but but to inspire our 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 legislators to do things. It to, to so I said that we're learning and teaching from each other. So when when I was walking up, there were a lot of people looking at, well, what's he doing? And when and he seems to be having a good life. I mean, he doesn't seem to be suffering. Uh, so you know. I think that you 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 raise everyone's consciousness by the things that you do. If you if you don't do anything, people look at you and go, "Oh, well, they're not doing anything. Why should I do something?" You know, <laughs> and they don't seem worried. Why should I worry? So I, I think that the individuals do have we as individuals we do have a lot of uh, we have a lot of uh, influence. And uh, and I tell young children that, you know, you can walk, you know, walk more. It's not that you're going to save the planet by walking, but you're going to teach someone else. Someone's going to see you and they're going to ask why. And and that kind of education uh, is something that we need to get that kind of consciousness, consciousness to get our legislatures to uh, to do things, because one of those children walking are going to one day be that legislator. You know, I mean, that's <laughs> that's how it is. The children are our future, uh, and, and it works like that. Very good. As we pointed out, like someone like uh, Ms. Haas, you know, it's, uh, you know, the solution's there, but it's the rest of us to provide the tools and knowledge that can be leveraged in the sustainable solution. So, um so thank you, everyone. Uh, I did put in the chat that uh, Star Tides has organized a second panel discussion, uh, three institutions supporting science and the uh, SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. This is a hybrid event uh, uh, this coming Friday, September 30th, from 2 to 3 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, the, the Zoom link has just been posted in the website there. Uh, I'm still waiting on the room, building and room uh, reservation uh, for those uh, who will be attending uh, in New York City. Um, but I do want to thank uh, those who attended uh, today. Uh, Aaron? Yes. Is that the Zoom link? It looks like a schedule. No, this is, this is, this is for the, this is for the uh, website and the Zoom link is inside there. Oh, okay. Great, thanks. Yep. And Aaron, if I could just if I could just extend a thank you to Dr. Oyun Ravsal uh, from JEMR LLC Mongolia yes. for not only staying through our session, but also probably being the most distant persons perhaps here. Absolutely, and uh, yes, a, a country in itself dealing with uh, its role in uh, in energy and climate change. Uh, so. Uh, Thank you all. Um, we'll conclude today and uh, reconvene uh, in the next uh, on Friday afternoon, Friday morning. Goodbye. Thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron.